Okay, so in the video here, let me see, sorry, I didn't select the pointer. We're going to look at the properties of, and reactions of nitriles. Okay, so we've had most of the reactions of, actually, uh, yeah, for, we've had pretty much all the reactions for nitriles before. Uh, in chapter 8, we looked at the SN2 reaction, how if you had an alkyl halide or a tosylate and it was suitable for the SN2 reaction, it would react with sodium cyanide to convert it to the nitrile. Okay, and the only limitation on that reaction is the limitations of the SN2 reaction. If it's not a good SN2 substrate, the reaction won't occur. In the ketone aldehyde chapter, we saw how we could take, uh, let's not use hydrogen cyanide, it's a little toxic, uh, NACN, then uh, H3O plus. That will convert an aldehyde or ketone in the into the corresponding cyanohydrin, which is technically a nitrile as well. Okay, we'll look at one new method, and that is the dehydration of primary amides. Okay, so if you have a primary amide, you can take water out of the amide by treating it one, with one of these dehydrating agents here, uh, P2O5, SOCl2, or anhydrous sulfuric acid and heat will all dehydrate the nitrile, or dehydrate the amide to give you the nitrile. Okay. Uh, if we look at the uh, physical properties of the nitrile, the nitrogen lone pair in a nitrile, like we have there, is not particularly basic. Okay, so this makes it a poor hydrogen bond acceptor. It's not a hydrogen bond donor because you don't have a hydrogen on well, nitrogen. Uh, we do have a strong dipole, and uh, smaller nitriles are actually quite polar. Okay, so. This poor hydrogen bonding you see reflected in its water solubility. The uh, nitrile isn't nearly as water soluble as the corresponding aldehyde. Okay, the boiling points uh, also less as well. Uh, here uh, it's 119 degrees for the nitrile and 166 for a comparable molecular weight aldehyde. All right, let's look at uh, the main reactions we're going to talk about. Uh, acid catalyzed nitrile hydrolysis, uh, which was introduced in the carboxylic acid chapter. The ultimate product of a nitrile hydrolysis is a carboxylic acid and some form of either ammonia or uh, ammonium ion. Okay, so under acid catalyzed conditions, we make the carboxylic acid and the ammonium salt. What happens here is that this nitrogen lone pair, remember, isn't very basic, so it takes a rather strong acid to get this process started. Once the nitrile is protonated, it very readily reacts with water to generate the species that you see here. Loss of the extra proton gives you this uh, funny looking species here, which is really just a tautomer of the amide. And I don't know if you remember tautomers uh, from a long time ago in the first half of the class, but it's uh, isomeric compounds that are in equilibrium. Recognize these aren't resonance structures, they're isomeric compounds because uh, the connectivity is different, right? Here there's a hydrogen at oxygen, and here there is no hydrogen at oxygen. Okay, so they can't be resonance because of that, but they are in equilibrium. Equilibrium heavily favors the amide structure. And once we have an amide, we're already under the conditions required to hydrolyze the amide. So if you look at the mechanism for amide hydrolysis, that would finish this out, and we would get the ammonium ion and the carboxylic acid. Okay. Base catalyzed nitrile hydrolysis uh, is a little bit more difficult. Uh, it's really base induced nitrile hydrolysis. We, it's not catalytic, sorry about this term here.
Okay, so what happens here is that the nitrile isn't pre-activated by protonation, so we take the stronger nucleophile hydroxide here compared with water up here, and this will add to the nitrile to give us this uh, anion in water. This is going to be reversibly protonated, and again, this is the tautomeric form of the amide. It turns out under base catalyzed or base induced nitrile conditions, you can actually stop the reaction right here if you don't heat the solution too much. But a base, remember, will hydro or sorry, base will hydrolyze an amide. So under most conditions, the reaction is going to progress further to give you the carboxylate salt under basic conditions and ammonia. And this mechanism, again, we recovered, we covered that when we talked about amides. Okay, okay, so that mechanism from uh, the primary amide to the carboxylate salt and ammonia has already been covered when we talked about amide hydrolysis. Okay, another reaction we can do for Greenyards is addition of Greenyards organolithiums to nitriles. And this is one of the few reactions where we can take a Greenyard reagent and directly produce a carbonyl compound. Okay. All right, so I'm going to take this creative license I've been taking, uh, turning the or treating the Greenyard reagent as if it's a free carbanion. Okay, it's just a nucleophile here. And after Acidic hydrolysis, we're going to get the unsymmetrical ketone that has the uh, cyclopropyl group from the nitrile and the cyclopentyl group from the Greenyard reagent. All right, what happens here is that we do the nucleophilic addition once. We get this anion. With esters, we were always worried about adding twice, but look what happens if we add twice here. Can I imagine that? All right, so here's our product. And there is no way anything like this is ever going to happen, right? Uh, because we can't generate a doubly anionic nitrogen. That's a really, really strong base. All right, so this is going to sit here just waiting for someone to come along and add some aqueous acid. This is going to turn this salt or this anion into the neutral imine. And the imine is going to hydrolyze to produce the ketone. All right. Um, there's other types of carboxylic acids. We're not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to briefly mention them. We've talked about lactones and uh, esters, lactones and lactams before. And um, in this class, we're just going to treat lactones as cyclic esters. They're slightly more reactive than uh, normal esters, but uh, the reactivity is pretty close. So we're just going to treat it as having reactivity equivalent to an ester. Okay, a lactam is a cyclic amide and its reactivity is equivalent to an amide. We're going to encounter one class of activated lactams in just a few minutes. Okay, if we have a nitrogen and we have two acyl groups, this is kind of the nitrogen analog of an anhydride, we call it an imide. Okay, you see here why Organic chemists have to be very careful how they pronounce their vowels and stuff, like we've had very similar terms, amide, imine. Okay, so this is not really that different uh, as far as the combination of letters goes. All right, so that's going to be a little bit more reactive than your average amide because uh, the nitrogen lone pair isn't quite as available for stabilizing resonance. It's being shared between two carbonyl groups. Okay, so we don't have one carbonyl group hogging all the rel all the resonance, right? Okay, so, uh, so it's a little bit more reactive than your average emit. 
Okay, this is a carbonate. Uh, this is an acyl group that has two oxygens on it. This is called a carbonate ester. This is a lot more stable than your typical ester. This is because uh, resonance is coming from two sources, right? Even more stable than a carbonate is a carbamate or urethane. And this has the stronger resonance of an amide coupled with the resonance for an ester on the other side. And when we have two nitrogen groups contributing to the stabilization, we call it a urea. And the, this carbonyl group here is extremely stable. It's getting resonance stabilization from two different nitrogens. Okay. All right, so this is a special type of lactam that's very important in medicine. This is called the uh, beta-lactam. And this is just a four-membered ring with a cyclic amide. Okay, normally amides aren't all that reactive, but this one is activated. Due to angle strain. Okay, so because it's in a four-membered ring, it wants to open that four-membered ring, and that tends to make it more reactive. All right, so penicillin is an important discovery by, I guess, Alexander Fleming in the 1920s. He noticed that one type of bacteria was killing another type of bacteria. Then uh, chemists wanted to try and isolate what the specific material in that bacteria was that was causing this effect, and they isolated penicillin. Okay, here's what penicillin does. It reacts with a bacterial cell wall protein. This is a little ball here. It's just a humongous molecule that has an active NH2 group at the end. All right, so this NH2 group is going to engage in nucleophilic acyl substitution and eventually open the four-membered ring, and uh, because this protein is now not available to the bacteria, it can't assemble its cell wall, and the bacteria dies. Bacteria aren't totally defenseless, though. They have a chemical at their disposal called beta-lactamase. Okay, so beta-lactamase is a molecule that bacteria possess that has the ability to destroy beta-lactams like penicillin. Okay, so what happens when you take penicillin for an infection and you get rid of 90% of the uh, bacteria because you feel just fine at that point, um, you've left the 10% behind, and these 10% are the ones that had more of this beta-lactamase. So when they now reproduce, they reproduce for, uh, copies of themselves, and uh, it's a much stronger bacteria, much more resistant, and this is how we get resistant bacteria. Chemist at Hoffman LaRoche invented clavulanic acid, to, uh, and that tricks the uh, bacteria into thinking that clavulanic is, acid is a is a beta-lactam that they have to get rid of. And when they go here, what happens here is that because it opens and makes an enol, uh, this uh, tends to make the deactivation process not reversible, and this uh, inactivates uh, beta-lactamase. Okay, so Augmentin is a uh, commonly prescribed antibiotic. It's a penicillin clavulanic acid Mixture of penicillin to kill the bacteria, clavulanic acid to battle their ability to uh, acquire resistance. Okay, and this is a problem in the design of new antibiotics. A very high percentage of them have a four-membered ring amide as the center of their activity, and in theory, uh, a lot of bacteria have grown to the uh, or evolve to the state where they can just uh, kill that chemical structure. So uh, because uh, we've sort of spent a, many years developing uh, derivatives of penicillin, uh, we're losing or we're having 
serious troubles with uh, bacterial resistance. Not all bacteria depend on the four-membered ring nitrogen, but a very high percentage of them do. Okay, and this is uh, one of the weaknesses in uh, modern antibacterial development. We need new models for uh, things that uh, kill bacteria. This old tried and true one isn't really quite as reliable as it used to be. Okay, uh, the very last chapter in the textbook is, is on polymer chemistry, so we're not going to cover that, but i just like to just summarize a little bit about polymer chemistry. If we take an acid that has two acid groups and an alcohol that has two alkyl, alcohol groups, we can just make an ester, and uh, this ester uh, will just make a chain that goes on forever because we have difunctionality on each piece. And this is called a polyester. Okay, so polyester just means polymeric ester. As a byproduct here, we also make water, so I guess this is why it's called a condensation polymer. Uh, it evolves a byproduct, water. Okay, uh, amides uh, can also be uh, engaged in polymerization of that type. Uh, so chemists at DuPont in the 30s, uh, inspired by the high tensile strength of a, of a spider web, decided to see could they make uh, polymeric amides. And this is how we get nylon. Nylon, uh, the most uh, simple form of nylon, involves a six carbon diamine and a six carbon carboxylic acid. And we're just doing this uh, condensation reaction that uh, evolves water and these couple together to make a polymeric amide of this structure here, nylon 66. The 66 just stands for a six carbon acid combined with a six carbon diamine. Okay. All right, so there's these weak hydrogen bonds in uh, polymeric amides of this type. Uh, most of us know that uh, these nine-membered rings like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so this is a nine-membered ring. That's not the most stable ring system, but they do form these weak hydrogen bonds of this type, and they're easily disrupted by just pulling on the ends of the molecule. Okay, so you could pull drag this in this way and drag this in this way mechanically and uh, that would break the hydrogen bond okay without too much of an energy cost you break your hydrogen bond but you also get rid of the inherent strain in a nine member ring okay so i guess i just gave you a molecular explanation for why pantyhose stretch all right some chemist a few years ago came up with the idea that uh if we take the sp3 carbons in nylon and replace them with benzene rings, we'll have a much stronger polymer. And this is where we get Kevlar, the uh, material that bulletproof vests are made of. Uh, and this is a very strong polymer. Uh, the bonds in Kevlar are much stronger than the amide bonds in uh, nylon. Okay, or actually the chain, the bonds within the alkyl chains are much stronger in Kevlar. I think the uh, effect on the amide bonds is, I might be headed the other direction, but uh, that was already a strong bond to begin with. Okay, here's a classic uh, type of question. Let's rank the following compounds as to their relative reactivity toward ammonia, a typical nucleophile uh, for these types of reactions. We're going to rank the most reactive as number one, the least reactive as number eight. Okay, so primary considerations here are, are this general reactivity pattern. Acid chlorides are more reactive than anhydrides, more reactive than esters, more reactive than amides, although we didn't cover it. Common sense would tell you that something that's already an anion isn't all that going to be all that reactive to a nucleophile. Okay. All right, so we know that uh, electron donating groups stabilize carbonyl groups. Therefore, they're going to make them less reactive 
whereas electron withdrawing groups make them less stable or more reactive. So we say electron withdrawing groups are going to activate, electron donating groups are going to deactivate. All right, if we look here, these two here are acid chlorides. The nitro is going to be more reactive than the methoxy, so this is number one. Number two, okay, we have one anhydride. That's going to be number three. The rest are either esters, amides, or carboxylate salts, so the esters are going to be next. This one has no electron withdrawing group on the benzene ring, and this one does have an electron withdrawing group. So this is going to be number four and number five. Okay, we have two amides. This one uh, has a lot of uh, serious steric hindrance. Okay, coming from these methyl groups right here and from this uh, rather large t-butyl group. So this carbonyl group is kind of hidden. So we're going to rank this one ahead of this one. And this one is not going to be very reactive at all. Okay, all right, so there's our relative reactivity. I always like to check to make sure that I got my own problem correct. Yeah, okay. All right, so that looks to be, uh, make sense, right? If you look at these trends down here. Okay, all right, uh, the last thing we'll look at are spectroscopy issues. Okay, so the effect of electron donation and conjugation on carbonyl stretching frequency is exactly the same in esters, amides, acid chlorides. Okay, an electron withdrawing group causes the stretching frequency to increase, an electron donating group causes it to decrease, and conjugation causes it to decrease. Okay, so amongst the general types of carbonyl carboxylic acid derivatives, the acid chloride has the highest value for stretching frequency. The amide has the lowest, and this is because there's a lot more single bond character in the CO bond due to this resonance interaction of this type. Uh, there's a, a lot less of that type of resonance going on in the acid chloride. Uh, the ester is intermediate in that regard, so we see a carbonyl stretching frequency that's intermediate between acid chlorides and amides. Okay, so we still, this is a fairly important resonance interaction since uh, oxygen is technically more electronegative than chlorine. Uh, we can see how this more resonance interaction more than compensates for that added electronegativity. All right, when we compare uh, the first ester with the second ester, what we see is the effect of conjugation. Uh, here at 1740, we introduce a conjugating group to it, and it drops down to 1728. Okay, if we look at proton NMRs, the hydrogen adjacent to a carbonyl group is 2 to 3 ppm, just like in all the other types of carbonyl groups. This is a unique type of uh, hydrogen in an ester. We see it a little bit higher than what it is in the corresponding alcohols or ethers. It uh, starts at 3.7 for a methyl ester and goes up to about 5 for like an isopropyl ester. Okay. And amid one of the structural features that we're going to see is that there's a lot of carbon-nitrogen double bond character in the carbon-nitrogen bond. We're going to see restricted rotation. So oftentimes with amides, uh, like this dimethyl amide here, you'll see non-equivalent methyl groups. Okay, The methyl groups are acting like they're chemically different, and they are. One of these methyls is cis to oxygen. One of these methyls is cis to the R group. All right, in the C13 NMR spectrum, we're not going to see anything that's going to differentiate ester from amide, from acid, from acid chloride. They all have this uh, 
chemical shift range of like 160 to 185. Uh, but we can distinguish carboxylic acids and their derivatives from ketones and aldehydes. In those cases, the chemical shift of the carbonyl carbon is much higher at 190 to 220. Okay, so here's the spectrum of uh, N-N-dimethylpropionamide. What you'll notice here is that if you look at the methyl ester, there's actually two singlets. And at room temperature, these methyls are non-equivalent. You can take the NMR spectrum at higher temperatures, and these methyls, if you get the temperature high enough, will eventually interconvert fast enough that they, what well, we could say, coalesce to a single peak. But at uh, room temperature, they are, in fact, two peaks. The rest of the spectrum looks kind of like you'd expect it to. The quartet for the CH2 group right here. Sorry. And the uh, triplet for the CH3 group right there. Okay. All right, here's a uh, infrared spectrum of uh, and proton and more spectrum of a nitrogen that or a amide that has a hydrogen at nitrogen. Okay, here we see the NH stretch. It's usually not quite as large uh, as the OH. And uh, we see uh, the uh, C double bond O stretch down here. What you see here is that we have uh, two methyls. This is from the fact that uh, that the methyl group, uh, okay, if we look at the resonance structure here, These two compounds here technically are not the same compound. Okay, um, and so we have two methyls, and there's a little bit of complexity in the rest of the spectrum. Uh, not much complexity. It, it looks. The rest of it looks like a perfect quartet and triplet, actually. Down here, we have the uh, NH, which is uh, broad. Typically comes from about uh, 5 to uh, 8 ppm. And it's kind of like the carboxylic acid peak. It's uh, sort of broad, not well defined. It doesn't come quite as far uh, doesn't have quite as high chemical shift as the OH of a carboxylic acid because uh, nitrogen is not as electronegative as oxygen. So uh, it comes at a higher or at a lower chemical shift. R recall that the uh, OH group of a carboxylic acid would come usually between like 11 and 15 parts per million. Okay, so the last one we're going to look at is a spectral matching problem. And we're going to match spectra with these compounds. Uh, just to, like, sort of differentiate them. I'm going to call them A, B, C, and D. All right. Let's first look at the infrared carbonyl stretching frequency and try to predict what type of uh, group that is. That's 1686. None of these are conjugated. This looks to be an amide, right? This one's very high. This one looks like it's an acid chloride. Okay, there's only one acid chloride up there, so let's uh, just call this C. All right, this one's intermediate. It's not really way up at 1800, but it's kind of in the middle range here. This looks to be 
the ester. And there's only one ester up there, so let's just call this D. And this CO looks to also be an amide. So this is a, a or B. This one has to be A or B. All right. Um, one thing I, I'll just point out here is that these two are easily distinguished by this peak right here, right? Singlet three hydrogens. Which of these compounds has a singlet three hydrogens? Well, if we look at for methyl groups, our only methyl group here is adjacent to a CH2. So this methyl we expect to be a triplet. This methyl here, however, doesn't... There's no hydrogen here. And even if it was, it probably exchanged rapidly due to hydrogen bonding. So this one is our one that's going to be a singlet. OK, so we've uh, pretty much matched them. That is compound A. It has no singlets. Uh, uh, our triplet that I identified way at the bottom is this one at 1.1. And as you see, look at adjacent to nitrogen, we have uh, two CH2 groups that are right at nitrogen. Uh, so we have one of them is a triplet, one of them is a quartet. This is, of course, the quartet. This is the triplet. All right, so that's uh, A. This one we've already identified as C. None of the proton chemical shifts are particularly high. Okay, so not... None of the uh, hydrogens are on the same carbon as an oxygen or nitrogen. All right, this one is uh, a ester. Okay, here we have triplet four hydrogens. This is kind of a high chemical shift, triplet two hydrogens rather, and this is the one right here. It's adjacent to a CH2 group, so of course it's going to be a triplet. By process of elimination, the last one has to be B, and that's again the one that has the uh, singlet at 2.9 ppm. Okay, so this is where 